This is uh, lesson number three on, our, on the series that we had started on teaching on the vision. It's important that we, uh, as a congregation, that we um, embody this vision. And, and so it's important for me as a pastor to um, relay this vision that the Lord has given to Tara and I. And, the, you know, the, the thing about it is if God has you serving here and um, has you a part of this church then it's the vision that he's given you also you know he's not going to give me a vision and you're going to have a complete different idea now we might have different approach and different way that that we go about things or you know or uh, uh, different callings giftings there's a, there's a variety you know it says in um, over in first Corinthians chapter 12 that there is a, a variety of gifts but one spirit you know so there there are different callings there's different ways of doing things and going about things but but if God's got us here working together then then we need to all be pulling the same direction you know and, and have uh, common goals anyway so let's just read our vision we're gonna we're gonna read it just every week so uh, get really familiar with it and, uh, a while back Tara had printed out some copies of uh, had it typed it out on some on paper and had printed some copies and hung them up in different places and I appreciate that because it helps me to remember when I come in in the morning, I have a, a copy of it right in front of my desk. And, and I remember, you know, what it just kind of brings you back to uh, focus because there can be a lot of things going on in life and, you know, and, and chasing a lot of different rabbits and a lot of different avenues that we go down. So it's always good to come back to center and remember what our objective is and, and what we're trying to accomplish. Amen? So... Our, our, um, our vision statement reads this way. Our vision is to seek out and win the lost and disciple all believers into the calling God has on their life, teaching them to observe all things Jesus taught. We want Freedom Fellowship to operate in the fivefold ministry of Jesus as referred to by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, raising up all believers to be a part of that ministry for the perfecting of the saints. Our desire is to worship Jesus in spirit and truth with demonstrable passion to send out equipped ministers for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's our direction. Pastor Friend did a uh, good job teaching on the teaching office of the fivefold ministry last week. And I wanted to focus in on the part of the vision that says we want Freedom Fellowship to operate in the fivefold ministry. Of Jesus as referred to by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 4.11. Now, I considered taking that portion of our vision statement out and changing that into we want to love people into the calling God has on their life. Because basically the, this, the vision statement is built around the ministry of Jesus. It's built around evangelism. It's built around discipleship, pastoring, um, the prophetic ministry that uh, the Spirit operates in. And, you know, the Spirit operates in that a lot of times through worship. And, and it's, it, it's, uh, it needs to be more a part of our, of our uh, worship gatherings and our worship services. And we don't need to allow uh, COVID or anything else that changes our normal routine or our, our way of going about things to uh, hinder prophetic ministry from going on in our worship services. So how do we engage in that? Tara's going to teach on that. She thinks it's next week, but I think it's going to be the week after because I think this is going to be part one of this lesson tonight. I think there's going to be two parts. There's just a lot. Well, and, and I'm just scratching the surface of it doing two parts, but I wanted to talk about pastoring a little bit, and uh, but I'm just going to talk about the fivefold tonight mainly. But Prophetic worship ought to be going on, or prophet, the, the, the gift of prophecy should be coming out in our worship service. You know, it should be something that's a part of it. And, and um, you know, I believe for that to come out, we have to engage in worship. We can't come in and just sing songs and just, you know, um, whatever. Just go through the motions, the routine. We can find ourselves in that place where we're just kind of going through the, the motions and the routine. We have to engage in worship. Jesus told the woman at the well that God is spirit and those who worship 
will worship in spirit and in truth. Paul said that the kingdom of God is not meat and drink as you suppose, but it's what? Love, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost? Is that what it is? Something like that. It's a, it's a spirit. It's not these, it's not the, you know, the, we want to get, go into that place of the presence of God where his tangible presence is felt and known, but these tangible things that, that uh, you know, music and instruments and, and the gathering together and, you know, and different things that are, that are tangible to us, um, sometimes we, we get so focused on those that those become um, our worship rather than, and we neglect the spiritual side of that. So, all right, I'm not going to preach Tara's message. Kind of am. We have to we have to engage in that. We can't allow, allow uh, you know a crazy year or anything like that to separate us as a congregation from that and and take us out of a place where we we don't engage in the spirit during worship. Paul, the reason one reason Paul said I would rather if you prophesied than speak in tongues is not because he had a problem with people speaking in tongues or praying in tongues, but it was because of confusion. And he said the fact that whenever you prophesy, somebody else can hear your thanksgiving and it can cause thanksgiving to rise up in them. That's why we come together and worship. So we hear one another's testimony. And, 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 you know, and, and we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. So whenever we engage in worship and somebody beside you is getting full of the Spirit and you hear them thanking and praising, it stirs something up in you. That's part of the edifying. That's the building up. Amen. So... We don't, want to, we don't want to get away from that. Look, look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 16. It says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way unto him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love lord just speak to us tonight minister your word to us we love you jesus we thank you for the ministry your ministry to us and thank you lord that you extend that and and give us the opportunity to minister lord thank you jesus Lord, help us and anoint us and use us in that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me get my water. I seriously was considering a big step in my life during worship. I'm thinking about quitting coffee. <laughs> We don't have to separate. <laughs> That's not something to break fellowship over. <laughs> I'm tired of it. <clears throat> that was a side note. <laughs> to minister. Man, it's like it drives me out all the time. I drink a cup and then get up here and try to sing. And I think, how stupid were you for drinking that coffee? You know, brother friends, like I've been trying to tell you, tea is where it's at. I'm not doing tea either. Yuck. All right, the ministry. To minister is to serve. In, in, in essence, it, it means to, to serve. So this, this five-fold ministry that we talk about, you don't really see that. You're not going to find somewhere in the Scripture where it says five-fold ministry. Okay, but we say that. We talk about that a lot. These are the, the offices of ministry that Paul mentioned here in, um, in verse 11. The apostles, the prophets, evangelists, the shepherds and teachers. Now, a lot of times what we do with this is um, we have these preconceived ideas about what, um, what these offices entail. 
And, and you know, and there are characteristics probably that go along with these, undoubtedly, or, or there are. But, you know, like so many times if somebody, if we say that someone has the gift of evangelism, we have this idea in our mind that they have to be like preaching crusades or, you know, that they, they have to be a Billy Graham or something like that in order to be an evangelist. And yet the calling and the office of, of evangelism is, is, uh, is simply those who have a heart for the lost and, and you know, and that's, it's, a, it's a, a calling that they have and it's, a, it's something that's close to their heart to pray for the lost. To, to witness to people on their job, to share things on Facebook, you know, from a, um, from a, a um, call to repentance. That's, that's a big part of evangelism is the, the desire to see people turn away from sin and to turn to the things of God, to see them set free. And so, you, can, you know, we can have that without being a, you know, a TV preacher. And, uh, but sometimes we have these ideas when it comes to pastor. In, in the ESV, it words it shepherd because ultimately that's what the word pastor in, in King James, the Greek word that, that uh, is translated pastor, it, it basically means a shepherd or an overseer, someone who cares for the flock. And so pastoring is something that so many times we say, you know, somebody has the calling, they have a, a pastoral office, then automatically we think in our mind that they have to be the pastor of a church, that they have to be uh, leading a congregation. But you can be a pastor in your home. You can be a pastor. You can be a pastor to those around you in your your area of influence. A pastor is someone who sees um, a, an opportunity to love someone, show someone kindness, and and literally to love them into the calling that God has on their life. A a, a pastor or a shepherd. A, a shepherd doesn't want to see harm caused to the sheep, and so he's a protector of the sheep. He's a protector of the flock, you know. So, so we, we have to kind of get these preconceived ideas out of our mind about um, what that these offices, that they demand, um, you know, position or something like that. Because in order for us to do what our vision says and to operate in the the five-fold ministry, that has to be going on within our congregation, not just, not just in, in uh, places of position on the platform, but it has to be going on during the week, Monday, Monday through Saturday. The, you know, these offices need to be at work in our life. And, and the, the beautiful thing about this is this is Jesus' ministry. This five-fold service is to the body of Christ. It's a ministry of Jesus. It's a, it's a way that Jesus serves us. Amen? It's his ministry serving his body. And it's carried out through these, these uh, five offices. There's, there's, Jesus operated at a high level in these, in all five of them. He operated as, as an apostle, as prophet, uh, as evangelist, as pastor, as teacher. He operated in these in anointing and in authority and so he set an example and it's the way that that we are to minister um i have some scriptures for you if you're taking notes i just want to i'm not going to read these i just want to give them to you the examples of jesus and there's many more these are just some that that i have uh jesus as the apostle hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1 if you want to write that down jesus says prophet we see a prophecy of him as a prophet in Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 18. He prophesied in, uh, in uh, well, many, many places. But one is in uh, Matthew chapter 24 that we would be familiar with. As evangelist, Mark chapter 2, verse 17 And Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. As pastor, John chapter 10 is, is a great picture of Jesus as, a, as the shepherd, as a great shepherd, and shepherd of the flock. So John chapter 10, verse 11, it said, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He's a protector. He's the, he's the one who would give his life for the sheep. Matthew chapter 9, 36 also uh, shows the, the pastoral heart 
that Jesus had. I'll read that one. It says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He looked on the multitude, and, it, and his heart was softened for them. Now, there's some of you, a lot of you in this room who uh, have the same characteristic. You see people, and you have compassion for them. You have a love for them, and you care about people. You check on people. You take care of them. That's a, that's a pastoral gifting that you're operating in. Jesus... He taught with authority. Nick, when Nicodemus came to him, and uh, this is him as Jesus as teacher in John chapter 3 and verse 2, Nicodemus said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And also write down Matthew chapter 5 verse 2. Well, just to speak to that, the, the anointing that Jesus had and how he operated in all five of these. Um, Nicodemus was a very well taught. He was a teacher himself. He was very well instructed, and he recognized the, the uh, authority in Jesus' teaching and the content in Jesus' teaching. He recognized that his teaching wasn't without results, like that when he taught something, that things changed. And Matthew chapter 2 I mean, uh, chapter 5, verse 2, it says, He opened his mouth and he taught them. And then we have Matthew chapter, the rest of 5, 6, and 7, which is the, the famous Sermon on the Mount, which is life lessons in, in every way and application. At the end of 7, it says, When Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. So we see this, how Jesus was the example to this five-fold ministry. And it's plain in Scripture that his ministry continues to be carried out by his body. Now this is, this is the beauty of it, that it's, the, that it's his ministry to his body. And yet he uses us to carry this out. And continue the work. In John chapter 15, verse 16, he said, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. <clears throat> Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So Jesus has chosen us. He's called us and sent us forth to, to bear fruit. And not, and not fruit that will fade away, but fruit that will remain. But he's also, he has equipped us for this calling. He said that, he said, how, what would be their, their enabling to be witnesses of him. To be a witness of him is one who, who shares the story of, declares the testimony of. Whenever we are a witness of Christ, when we're a witness of Christ in our day-to-day -day life, we exhibit Christ-like character in our day-to-day -day life. That's one way that, that we are a witness, not only by word, but also in deed. So what did he tell his disciples? You will be witnesses. You'll be the ones who carry out this testimony. You're going to spread this gospel. Authority has been given to me. Go and make disciples. What would be the enabling power that caused them to be able to spread this gospel and to declare who Jesus was, the good news about uh, redemption through, it, through the blood and through the cross, what would enable that and empower that? He said, you will receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you. 
Amen. So how the, 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 this five-fold ministry, we can study about it. We can learn all the characteristics of, of these five things. You know, uh, prof, uh, evangelists, they uh, preach hellfire and brimstone. Prophets are grouchy and, uh, you know, point their finger at people. Teachers are dry and boring. Just kidding, Brother Fran. You're not dry and boring. I did, a, I did a, a, uh, an online gifts test to find out what your spiritual gift is, and it came up teacher. And I was like, boy, you're a rotten liar. <laughs> but hey, maybe it is. I don't know. But then it was like 27 other people that I know took the test, and they all got teacher too. So I was thinking, hmm, kind of curious. But so we can learn all these characteristics, and we can we can uh, you know try to try to make these things happen in our life, and yet, in order to be a witness or in order to operate in that calling, in that appointment that Christ has put on our life, we have to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And have the Holy Spirit at work in our life. Now listen, God can use us in, in various ways at various times. He can use us in, in different callings and in, in different ministries. You know, I look at, at my, my uh, dad and everybody, uh, you know, will always say he, is a, he was an evangelist. You know, um, uh, Pastor Chris Kirkendall, he said that uh, in a pastor's prayer meeting that we had, he said, I believe that, that Pastor Shannon was uh, the most anointed evangelist to ever preach in Hardin County. Now, that's based off of what we, our experience and things that we've seen in, in church life. And, you know, and he's probably right in our time. I don't know who might have been here before that or, or anything else. But, but certainly a calling and a gifting on Dad's life to evangelize, evangelize the lost. But there's also a, a strong love for people. He has a love for people that, uh, that goes very deep. And, and cares for people, cares for people in their hurting and, and, and in their struggle, you know, just something that reached deep inside of him. So, see, you know, God can use us. God may, may call you. There may be somebody in here. He calls you to pastor, and you don't have the gifting of pastor. Well, he can anoint you for that, for that office, and he can use you in that office. But it's the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that's going to enable that in your life. So it's important that we, that we recognize that that we operate in the anointing of the Spirit. And, well, we'll get to that. <clears throat> Let's see. So Jesus' ministry or service to humanity... And the Father is reconciliation. Okay? This five-fold ministry encompasses that. His ministry, listen to what I'm saying, his ministry to humanity and also to the Father. Jesus was a servant. Paul said, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took on the form of a servant. So Jesus humbled himself. So we see that he came, he said, Jesus said, in my kingdom it's not going to be like that of the Gentiles. In order to be great, you're going to be a servant of all. This was the concept that he was trying to pass on. This was the concept, this was who he was. He was, he was a, a servant. And so he served humanity and he served the Father. Because whenever sin, uh, I'm not going to go there. Listen. His ministry, his reconciliation, Luke chapter 4. After his temptation in the wilderness, when he had gone out into the wilderness and, and uh, spent some 40 days there being tempted of the devil, it says that he returned in the power of the Spirit and he began to teach in their synagogues. So here he was in the wilderness. He had gone without food or, or water for 40 days, been tempted of the devil, been messed with and picked on by the devil. How many of you have been messed with and picked on by the devil? How many of you returned in the power of the Spirit after uh, getting picked on by the devil? Amen? Sometimes I return in the power of poutiness after being picked on by the devil. Sometimes I, 
I returned in the power of self-centeredness after being picked on by the devil. But it says that Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. His body was weak, but his spirit was strong. And he went and he began to teach in their synagogue. And this was what he did. He took the book of Isaiah. And in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, he declared what his mission was. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Did I say chapter 18? Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Y'all knew that, didn't you? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. His purpose, his mission, was to see people's lives changed for the good. He wanted to see those who were in bondage to sin, bondage to darkness, bondage to the devil, bondage to self, to see them set free. He said, the Spirit of the Lord has anointed me for this. He was the fulfillment of this prophecy of Isaiah that would bring reconciliation, restoration between humanity and God where sin had caused a separation. And, the, and, and it's important that we realize that he has given us this ministry in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 17 through 19, Paul said, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So Christ, Christ, this his ministry is to reunite the fellowship that was broken between heaven and earth when sin entered the world in the garden. And he has reconciled that relationship that we can have with God through the power of the Spirit. And he's given that to us. Paul said, what did he say there, that he uh, all this is from God who through Christ, reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So this, we see that this five-fold ministry, that this, this operation of apostles, and prophets, and evangelists, and pastors, and teachers, that it's for the purpose of seeing the, the, the captive set free. It's for the purpose of, of uh, those who are in bondage to the devil for that power to be broken off of their life and to reconcile them back into right standing and right relationship with God. That's the function and the purpose of the body of Christ, carrying on the ministry that Jesus began. It didn't end whenever he ascended. No, because he said, All authority has been given unto me. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Don't go hide out in the upper room, and when the Holy Ghost comes on you, just keep on going back to the upper room and having the anointing fall on you again and again. See, that's the that's one thing I think that we run into in the church is we like to come in here and, and get full of the Holy Ghost, and then we leave the Holy Ghost here when we go back home or when we go to our job. We go to our job and we talk just like everyone there. We use the same language that they use. We laugh at all this, the same things that they laugh at. Or, or, or maybe at home, we go home and we watch... Um, filthy movies we read filthy books i hope nobody in here is doing these things but i'm making a point and and and, and we do those things and then we come back into the church and we say if i i'll just go get my praise on i'll get my worship on we get all fired up and we go out and we don't take it with us nothing effect is changed or affected in our life we allow sin to remain in our life and there's no way to operate in the power the enabling of the holy spirit when we allow sin to be a part of our life whenever we're ready to get that out and, and remove those things and, and move on from, from baby Christendom into adulthood. Is that a real word? Whenever we're ready to, to go beyond that, we begin to lay the, the, those things of this world down. And we begin to function and operate in the enabling and the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's when we become a part of this five-fold ministry. We, we begin to operate as part of the body of Jesus Christ. So he's given that to us. That's our responsibility. He's given us this ministry through grace. Ephesians 4 uh, verse 7. If you read that probably next week. Um, 
I think next week's lesson will be a little more exciting if y'all want to come back. We're going to look more at the first part of this chapter because Paul's talking all about unity. And unity is something that we need. That's why we're teaching on this vision because we need to be in unity around what the, the, the vision and the objective is of, of this congregation and, and how we want to reach out and affect this community. If we're not changing the, the neighborhood around this church, then what are, what are we doing? We're just coming in here and we want, Lord, send the Holy Ghost, send the Holy Ghost, send the Holy Ghost. We want the Holy Ghost on us. We, by all means, we do. I want, I want to just I want to do the watermelon crawl across this thing next Wednesday night, you know, and everybody in here just full of the Holy Ghost. I mean, I want to see it. My, uh, I had a friend that I worked with back way back in the day. Holy Ghost was just falling in this place like crazy. And uh, and I don't know where, where he heard about some of the manifestations or whatever, but I said, hey, uh, you, wanna, you ought to come to church with me Sunday morning. He said, I ain't going in there and frying like bacon on the ground like y'all do. Because <laughs> people would get slain in the spirit and they'd be shaking and just bouncing all over the place. He said it looked like they were frying like bacon, so I don't know when he had ever seen it. But I'd love to fry like bacon, but frying like bacon doesn't do you any good if we don't carry it beyond here. If we don't go outside of these four walls with it, 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 doesn't, uh, it doesn't change, and I'll show you that. It doesn't change the body of Christ. So he gave us this ministry through grace. Verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 7 it says, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of of Christ's gift. Now, this, these are some notes from Albert Barnes, whether you, you like him or not. I like some things he says. He says, it's a gift that's bestowed on us. It's not what, what, what is originated by ourselves. So these are, these are a, a gifting. A gift is something that you cannot earn. Now, how many of y'all see these uh, on uh, TBN and, and all these different things? where they say, if you will send a gift of $50 or more, we're going to send you a Trump flag or whatever it is. And so y'all yank your credit cards out and, and get on there and send them a gift of $50 or more. If you have to send them a gift of $50 to get the flag, it's not a gift. Either way, you're paying for it. A gift cannot be earned. And so, you know, these are these are... These callings is gifting the gift of salvation that is given through to us by grace through faith. It is something that cannot be earned. It, it is absolutely by the merit of Christ what He has given us. Amen. And Albert says that it's a certain measure. It's not unlimited and without rule. There is a wise ad adaptation in imparting. By a certain rule, the same grace is not given to all, but to all is given enough to enable them to live as they ought to live. Now, you you might say, I don't, I don't know if I believe that. I disagree with that. Well, let me give you this example. As to, to this point in my life, my shadow has never healed anyone. They, I haven't been able to pray for a handkerchief and send it with some of the other saints and, and that heal uh, sick people. But that's the way it was for, for the Apostle Paul. Um, was it Elisha? His bones were in the grave, and they threw a dead man on top of him. They were trying to, to get rid of a, a dead body, and they threw it on top of him, and he sprang to life because of the anointing that was in Elisha's bones. So, so you can say you don't agree with that, but there's a, there is a measure of grace that is extended to us for these, for these giftings and for these callings. And, and, and you say, well, why, why? Is that right? Does God show favoritism? No, it's according. We'll look at that next week. It's according to the power that's at work within you. It's according to the measure of faith that you're willing to have. Amen? I'll show you next week. Y'all come back. The measure is the gift of Christ or what is given in Christ. It comes through him. Now, the amount that he gives is sufficient for his purpose. Now, that's, that's important. You know, you, we, we might, I, would, I would love more anointing. I would love for y'all to be more excited about my teaching and my preaching and me not have to say amen to get y'all to amen like I'd love for y'all to shout me down and everything. But I understand that what God has given me is enough for his purpose that he has me in. Whenever he gets ready for the purpose to be greater, the grace is going to be greater. 
the anointing is going to be greater. It's going gonna, it's gonna to grow. It's so, all right, y'all get it. John chapter 1, verse 16, it says, For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. It's the fullness of Christ. It's not up to us. Um, I think we affect the amount, and, and we'll look at that more of the grace that's poured out. But it's the fullness of Christ that we all receive grace upon grace. So here's the purpose of the fivefold ministry. I'm almost through. Look back at our text in uh, chapter 4, Ephesians 4. He gave those five offices. Look at verse 12. To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Equip this, uh, the, the meaning is a, a making fit or a preparing, training, perfecting, make fully qualified for service. So the purpose of the five-fold ministry, the purpose of these, these offices that we're, that we're talking about is for the, to equip the saints. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. It's not to equip the pastors. It's not to equip the evangelists. It's not to equip the teachers. Wait a minute. I'm not, I'm not a teacher. No, the, the purpose of this is to make prepared or make qualified for service the saints. Who are the saints? Somebody better raise a hand and say, I'm a saint. Amen. The purpose of this is to equip not just those who, who stand behind a pulpit or hold a position, but it's for the equipping of the saints, the body. That's everybody. That's all of us. It's for, for building up the body of Christ, he says. In the classical language, the word is used for setting a bone during surgery. So it's like if you broke your arm and uh, and that bone had to be reset. That's the that's this is the word that would be used. The equipping. It's an adjustment and getting it back in the right place. That's gross, huh? Sam's like, Rrr. I got a gross story, but I won't tell it. So Jesus uses these offices to adjust or get in the right place, the joints, the bones, the alignment of his body. So, so if this equipping is for the saints, the whole body, for the purpose of building up the body, let's look at, at some things out of, cha out of verse, uh, well, all the way down to 16. So the enhancements that, this, that the 5 ministry does for the body is brings us in unity in the faith. There needs to be a unifying of the body of Christ. We have we come from so many. Pastor Friend and I were talking about how culture is so different from the East Coast to the West Coast, and here in the South versus the North, culture is so different. And our perspective of of morals and and different things are, are so far apart. There needs to be a a unifying of the body of Christ. And this is what this, this ministry does. It, it brings us together. It brings us into the, the next thing is the knowledge of the Son of God. And I believe that that's twofold in that it brings us into the knowledge or an understanding of Christ. But it also, it, it, through the, the equipping work that this does, is, is the knowledge of Christ becomes seated in our hearts. Not a knowledge of who Christ is, but the, the, the wisdom and the riches of the fullness of that knowledge of Christ becomes alive in our heart through his word and through this, this the equipping of this uh, ministry. We become mature. We attain the full measure of Christ. These are, these are enhancements that this ministry does. See, the, the, the thing that we uh, probably don't talk about enough is growing in Christ and moving beyond the stage of, of just being a baby Christian into a, a place of mature manhood 
as Paul said here. And so the next thing is becoming mature and attaining the full measure. There we have that measure again of Christ. We're going to talk about that more next week. So the things that the, the fivefold ministry can prevent is it prevents stagnation. He said no longer being children. The problem is that we, we so many times is we don't move past being a child in our relationship with the Lord, in our growth with Him. We have just a, enough knowledge and understanding of His Word to get by. We, we, we don't apply the Word of God in our life and to our life on a daily basis, and we don't move past uh, being a child in the faith. There, you know, we don't understand the, the, the calling and the operation and these giftings that we're talking about. We don't understand that that needs to be applied to our life regularly and on a daily basis that this is something that we should operate and walk in because we're still children. But whenever this, whenever this five-fold ministry is at work in our congregation, in our midst, then it, it, it will stop us from being stagnant. It will allow more people who come in to grow and to move forward in their relationship with Christ, it it's, it uh, prevents waywardness. He said that uh, no longer. Let's see. Let me find it here. Chapter. I mean, uh, verse fourteen. He said, uh, "No longer tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine." So, uh, by trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, this fivefold ministry it roots out deceit because there there are lies. Of the enemy at work they they work on us all the time trying to deceive and, and lie to our hearts about uh our our belonging our uh position in the church uh, uh you know different something can happen there can be an offense or, or something like that and this idea this pop this uh this thought pops up in your mind that you know what i don't even need to go to church i don't even need to be a part of that because that's a lie, that's deceitfulness of the enemy that tries to, to creep its way in. This, as we grow and we strengthen in this ministry, it prevents those lies from uh, affecting us. So the, ultimately the result is this, speaking the truth in love, growing up in every way. And this, this right here is, is what it, it boils down to, that last part of or verse 16. It says, when joining together and working together, the body grows, and it builds itself up in love. So how does, how does Christ grow his church and, and build his body up? It's through this five-fold ministry. It's through, it's through apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And they're sitting all in this congregation tonight. They have various giftings and, and offices that many of you operate in on a daily basis. And we need to continue in that and grow in that. We need to, we need to learn how to uh, really function in these things in, t in team ministry and building up. I can't stand up here and, and be the apostle, the, the prophet, the evangelist, the, the pastor, and the teacher. I'm not, I'm not equipped that way. That measure of grace hasn't been poured out on me. Why? Because Jesus has put us here together to operate together. Some of you, you know, I see evangelists and, uh, and teachers and um, prophets and um, apostles in this place. We have to work together in, in team ministry to facilitate the ministry of Jesus Christ, the ministry of reconciliation to those all around us. Amen? And it's a building up. We've got to build one another up. And I believe that there's, a, there's an anointing that's coming as, as, we, um, as we learn about these things and, and uh, you know, the, like the deeper we get into discipleship and, and uh, reaching out and, and doing evangelism and, and maybe getting outside of these four walls more you know that was something that we were kind of starting to branch out into and then COVID hits and it's like feels like everything's shut down but it, there was really 
I felt like we were moving in a direction of connecting with our community. We had done several things outside of here, and, and I felt like that, you know, that, that I was getting really excited about what may have been about to happen. And then all this, you know, we get shut in and all this business, and, and I kind of felt all humdrum about it. But then the Lord just spoke to me, you know, that, that he didn't give us this vision for no reason. He's not caught off guard by the mess that's going on in our nation and all over the world. This hasn't trapped him, tricked him, or confused him. And so something great is coming, and I believe that as we move forward in these things, maybe he's given the church time during all this to, to grow a little bit and, and, and to, to step back and see where we are. I think he's certainly shown us a lot about where our country is and, and uh, you know, things that are going on around us. So we have a, a, a much better understanding of the climate that we're, we're operating in and working in. And I believe that there's going to be anointing on us. There's going to be more grace and a greater measure of anointing poured out to operate and facilitate this ministry of reconciliation. I hope y'all want to be a part of it. The growth is, is uh, you know, not in every time, but I believe that that growth speaks to, uh, to numerically. We need to be uh, winning the lost, that's got to be a part of, of what we're doing. That's got to be a part of the body of Christ is seeing souls saved. It's, it has, you know, it's, it's, it's a vital part. And then the edifying or the, the building up is something that, that happens within. Amen.